an exciting thing for one of our students is they were actually take, able to take the uh, project that they worked on with a copywriter and sell that product to their client. Great. Thank you. Um, are there any particular things that you've learned in that process in terms of how you help students um, get through any of those frustrations that you mentioned or develop additional skills outside of creativity that may be considered more traditional skills in terms of career development that you think are important for your students to, to learn and develop before well, they leave? You asked a really important question there. Uh, even in the teamwork, as we set up the team, um, one tip that we've found is when we put the students together, we took a look at students with higher GPAs and started to match students um, with higher GPAs together as opposed to a, a random um, pulling the name out of the hat. And that seems to have worked better because you're matching students who, um, it almost seems like they want to put in as much as they want to put in. So the A type students with the A type students, and the B type students with the B type students. Um, it resolved frustrations when you had an A type student put with a, a, a C type student and the commitment wasn't there. So there was um, some really good collaboration in that way. Um, and your other question, that was really good. I loved uh, that question. Um, what was the other question I can help answer? Um, I think you, you, you covered that pretty well, but it was really about uh, how do you blend uh, what might be considered some of the more of the traditional subjects or traditional skills that you want to make sure students develop um, right. before they graduate alongside the creative skills that they're developing. I think one of the things that challenged me early on in my career was they, they challenged me to think of my boss as a client. Um, if you start to have a different mentality in terms of client versus employer employee, um, I think there's a little bit more respect that goes on and you, you start to view the world a little differently. When you view things as clients, view your employer as a client, you want to do work for them as, uh, and try to impress them and try to put your best forward. Not that you don't as an employee, but there is a difference in thinking that way. So we really want to encourage the students as they deal with other students to not think of them as a student, but to think of them as a client that you can potentially work with. And I think that um, mindset really helps influence them, and we hope that influences them throughout their career. I think as well, um, getting things done on time. Uh, the crucial issues are always when there's an issue, um, you're not meeting a deadline or what have you. It's always important to reach out and connect uh, with the students um, and the client, make sure that there's clear communication, because I think so many times students um, who aren't completing assignments on time or aren't meeting deadlines have this ability to shy away and not say anything because of embarrassment. If you want to say no, you know, reach out with your communication skills and uh, people are human and talk to them. Meet mm -hmm. their expectations. Great. Well, here's a question um, from the audience and Remy. Uh, how do you help uh, Humber College students navigate the job market and opportunities after they receive their diploma? Oh, great. We, we love that question. Um, I'm going to pick on Adobe. When I first got the opportunity to go to the Adobe Education Leaders Summit, you had this thing called an unconference. And I thought, wow, what's, what a cool opportunity. So one of the ways we're helping students is we're starting to prepare some unconferences where bringing back alumni and current students into the program. We've actually um, contacted industry that are interested in coming as well. Um, I know we have one of our instructors who teaches for writing for TV and movies, and he's interested in being involved in that as well, where we just have a full day that Humber opens up and we get the rooms. And for every 20 minutes, there's going to be a different topic in each room. And the students can come and connect and, um, and relate with questions uh, that they have about, you know, maybe getting a job or if you're in a job, what skill set is needed. Um, some of the other things we do is we have a close connection with the Registered Graphic Designers of Ontario. And it's a professional organization where they uh, came in this week and talked with our students to say, this is what we can do for you. We can put you in contact with a number of the uh, people in our industry and uh, have portfolios reviewed. We invite alumni back. I think I'm always, you know, almost just in amazement at the alumni that want to come back to the program and want to be involved with the current students. Um, I keep thinking, this is amazing to me because you've just paid how much money to Humber. You're out in the industry, and then you are totally willing to take a day off and come and just talk with students and be involved in the community again. 
I think that just says to me how much of an impact we've had on them in a good way. Fantastic. Hey, for, so our audience understands, you want to give them a 30 second description of an unconference? Oh, sure. Absolutely. An unconference. I was blown away. I didn't know what it was either, but the unconference, maybe it's, you'll have say four or five rooms and they're all set up for the day. And those rooms um, are available for 20 minutes at a time. So we had this uh, huge whiteboard on the outside uh, at the Adobe uh, Center in San Jose. And we were able to write down what room and what topic. And we just put, here's the topic. And uh, the topic could be uh, getting a job. And you are the one who will start it and see it. So whether it's a student or whether it's um, an educator, they can just put it on a topic. They may be an expert in that area. They may not be an expert in that area. So for instance, if we have a student who's currently a student thinking, um, in a year's time, I need to get a job. I want to talk about jobs, how to get a job. And so we just put the topic up on the board in that room, that 20 minute section. And uh, they go into that room and then it's a dialogue about how to get a job. So the people who are in there are interested in that topic and they can uh, choose to give their opinions and expertise in that area. And uh, if that discussion is going really well and they wanna do it for another 20 seconds, then they can grab that. So it's not a, a set conference where you have all of the uh, schedules and topics set out ahead of time. It's something that's really fluid really enjoyed that. I thought it gave way to a lot of good conversations. Thank you. That's very helpful. So before we transition to the your presentation where you'll share with us more of the, your practices in the classroom, I know people are re really anxious to learn more about that. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit um, your comments about how you prepare students to find their passions and then continue their development in school and prepare for a career are wonderful. And I'm wondering if there's any tips you have for educators who are thinking about both for themselves and for the students, how do you continue after you're out of an academic environment to develop your creative skills and to keep your skills fresh and to keep yourself uh, motivated as, uh, as your career and your life as a creator continues? Right. I think part of that is getting involved in the community, as simple as that is. Um, if there's an Adobe community in your local area, that's great. Get involved with that. I highly recommend it because you'll get um, to be able to rub shoulders with people who are slightly out of your industry, but may have some similar questions that you do, or maybe you've actually got some expertise that you can pass along. Uh, one thing that happened this year that I was really pleased with is one of my friends uh, switched jobs. And um, as they were switching jobs, moving more from web to web and print, they had some questions for me on Adobe software, and I thought, wow, these are really good questions. Um, some of them I had the answers for right away. I actually had tutorials built up that I forwarded on to them, and some of them I didn't actually have the answers for, so I was able to take the time and go and find out what the solution would be. So in, in that regard, I wanted to figure out how to solve my friend's problem, and that I think helped me do even better in my career. I think another way of doing it is um, just being a good learner. Some of my favorite educators uh, through my education career have been good learners where they've just asked good questions. They've had, um, as they teach, things that they may not know or understand and they want to find out information about that as well. So I think having that attitude of being a learner has been a success in my career. And I think that's always a good thing to find out where there are problems and see if you can answer them. As opposed to, oh my word, I'm going to turn on the TV or Netflix. Yeah, very good points. Thank you. Well, as we transition, I'd like to switch over at this time to your presentation, if you're ready for that. Is that all right, Kevin? That sounds perfect. That sounds perfect. Okay, and as I do that, I just want to remind you that if you have questions specifically for Kevin, please feel free to post them in the chat box on the lower left corner and continue the conversation in our chat room as well. So I'm just going to switch pages and give you control. Oops, let me switch pages again. Great. Thank you. I'm just putting in the uh, session here a uh, link. Um, in the tutorial session, you may want to download the brackets. I hope I've got that URL in there correctly. Brackets is a, an open source app 
um, for coding that Adobe made. It's uh, actually, I'm really excited to see what Adobe does with it this year. I hear they're trying to make brackets part of the coding engine for Dreamweaver. The thing I liked about brackets was that it's open source, so any of the students who um, who couldn't afford um, the full Adobe Creative Suite a few years ago um, were able to download brackets, and it was uh, free for them to do. So it's a wonderful program. I love it. I've talked with the managers of brackets, and I uh, can't highly recommend it enough. Um, it's free, and it's 40 megs. So those all work into students' budgets and download time. Oh, oh, there's a photo of me. Great. So uh, that's kind of what I look like, um, although these days I tend to wear glasses more. Uh, my Twitter feed is at Island Contact, and if you'd like to email me further, my email at Humber College is there as well. All right. Again, just a little overview of Humber College. It's the largest college in Ontario with three campuses. We have 27,000 full-time students and 56,000 part-time students. So there's a lot going on at Humber all the time. So when we talk about collaboration, this is definitely a place where that can happen. Um, where exactly are we located? We are located in Canada, in Ontario, in Toronto, and here we are at Humber College, right next to the lakeshore. So this is where we are located, and uh, it's a great place. I love it. In the summer, we can actually walk down to the lake. Um, there's lots of green areas around here that we can just um, almost forget that we're right next to Toronto, the main city. This is what normally people think of when they think of Canada and Toronto. That's snow. And we actually just had our first snowfall about uh, two or three weeks ago. So winter's been very late for us, which I'm not opposed to. This is what one of our labs looks like. So it's a photo of one of our labs. So we actually have um, great benefit of having all the Macintosh towers there. Um, one of the other labs has all iMacs. Another lab has all the latest Power Macs. So we've got great equipment for the students to work on. We've got all the latest Adobe software in the labs. And uh, the labs fit about 40 students per section. So there's uh, a lot of students that are packed into the classroom. And yet I remember in university when we had uh, labs or lecture halls with four or five hundred. Um, these labs give us a chance that we can actually get in contact with each student and get to know them individually, especially when we go around. So as we're communicating with students, as we're trying to help them find their creative passions, this gives us an opportunity right there in the classroom to stop what they're doing and, uh, and give them encouragement where they, um, they may not think that they're good at something and we may see some amazing potential there and, uh, and that just helps, I know. It always helps when you have an instructor who encourages you and says something authentic about what you're working on. So the creative classroom. Here's some of my students from a portfolio show, and this is always our focus. I really enjoy working with the students and dealing with the students, um, whether it's through design skills or through academic skills and even beyond. I actually was able to help one of the students who has graduated, he graduated maybe about seven years ago and came back to me for a reference and for a new job he uh, was looking at and he just emailed yesterday to say that he's got that position. So again, I'm thrilled when my students get out there and uh, get great jobs and great positions and, and happy to be part of that. We want to feed their curiosity. We have two of these students at the portfolio show just looking at other students' work and uh, I think they're always amazed when they look at the final portfolios that each one of them um, create. There's about 60 of our students that graduate every year, and um, yeah, they're just the talent is there. So I'm really pleased. Ah, uh, yes, the thinker. So we're all in education, and one of the things I was uh, listening to, one of the people I was listening to, was Dallas Willard in some of his old podcasts, and uh, he's a philosophy professor at uh, University of Southern California. And uh, again, he focused on knowledge. And I think what we're doing, even in the creative world, we want to be really creative and we want to pass on knowledge. And we want our students to pass on, on knowledge through their education and through their work as well. One of the things that struck me that Dallas was talking about is that we're at the mercy of our own ideas. And I really had to think about that. And I think the students who are coming in from high school are trapped in their own ideas about what graphic design is. Uh, some students will think of it as, I get to play on the computer all day. Some of the other students are talking about 
um, what they want to do in terms of editorial design. So I think the education process is such a great way where we can connect students who are, are have talent to begin with and really refine that talent and help them move on into the industry themselves. So it's one of those thoughts that again caught me and uh, I want to share that with you guys as well, that we're at the mercy of our own ideas. And while the students are at the mercy of their own ideas, the challenge for me is that I'm also at the mercy of my own ideas. So as a great question, I'm going to talk about how do you guys generate your own creativity? I think that's the challenge for me as well, not to get stuck in my own ideas, but to be out there and to uh, be able to be challenged and be willing to be challenged. You know, sometimes as we get along in education, we can get down um, and frustrated with administration or the amount of work we have to do or, oh my word, marking again or student problems. But I think when it comes down to it, I think what a great career we have. This is amazing. I just want to encourage you guys, um, at wherever you are in terms of education, that, that we are making a difference. Ah, Noel, you asked a question about offering courses online. This is a direction I think Humber is looking at. I know that they, uh, talking to my associate dean, Humber is allowed to have 10% of their courses online at this point in time. And so it's definitely a direction we're going. Um, I, I'm, my preference is a hybrid idea where you have content online in terms of um, maybe the, the tools you're using, maybe coding HTML, that some of those videos can be put online. And then having open lab time where students can come in who have questions and they can be uh, talked with one-on-one -on -one and go through the issues that they're looking at directly. Does that help answer your question, Noel? All right, then move on to the next one. I'll have a direction. This one I found huge in the classroom. You have 40 students staring at you, and on the first day, it's always scary. Um, if you have a direction, a goal that you're moving in, this is a huge thing for the students because it just builds up their confidence that you know what you're doing and that engenders trust amongst you and the students as well. So knowing where you're going and uh, what I did this semester, I think, really helped is uh, just left the classroom for about five minutes, gave them a big, huge whiteboard with markers and said, look, here are three categories that I want you to uh, write on the board. Tell me what you know. Tell me what you don't know. And tell me what you'd like to know. And that allowed me to connect with the students um, directly. So we had the course outline. We want to make sure that we're actually dealing with the students. So I want to know where they have been and where they want to go so I can help um, connect them that way. Uh, another video I was watching just last uh, probably in December, was talking about instructors instead of being um, the sage on the stage, um, considering ourselves as more guides and helping the students. And they said, you know, pretend that you're a Gandalf from Lord of the Rings or pray that you're a Dumbledore, pretend you're a Dumbledore from uh, Harry Potter, that you're there to guide the students. So take the creativity that they already have and help move them along in that direction. Take the, uh, help them with their journey. No, I guess hybrid course would not help for those who are not in the Toronto proximity. Totally understand. I do hope to create some videos and post them up online in terms of brackets and Photoshop and some of the skills that uh, the students are asking for that way. Um, and I can pass that link out along um, once I've got things going. If you're interested, you shoot me an email. Uh, listening. Listening has always been a key in education. I think you know some of these things we all know. But listening um, to what is said and also listening to what not what's not being said um, and challenging things. Um, when I start my classes, one of the compliments I got this year was I tend to start my class because they have eight courses a week and mine is one of them. So when I start the class and say, OK, what do you remember from last week? I get to listen to what they remembered because even what we taught and we think we've communicated is not always what the students have understood. So I think that's been a key thing in the classes as well. And they actually enjoyed starting that way because they said it reminds us of what we did last week so we can get our head back in the game. It's also listening for what is not being said. So some of the um, information that gets passed along um, gives me a good reflection on what they took away from class. So some of the things that I think I've done an amazing job on, some of the students may come back and say um, that they didn't understand that from what I said. So it gives me a chance to refine and, and state again things that I've done in the classroom that I thought were important, or by the way, you may want to pick up on these things. And I think that again, just helps each class start off on the right foot. So again, if I go back to the idea of direction, they know where they were last week and they know where they're going this week. It builds confidence and builds trust. 
engage with your students, generate questions. Oh, yes. I, growing up, I had a, a Sunday school teacher whose class I hated to go to and loved to go to. And I picked up on one of his techniques in class. What I will do is during that time at the beginning of class when I'm asking questions about the, what they were learning from the week before is I will ask them, um, again, do they um, do they agree with that? So if a student says, oh, yeah, I think we uh, went over learning how to do HTML coding and, and CSS and we learned how to do a hover effect. I'll say, okay, great. I'll ask another student, is that correct? Do you remember that from last class? And they all say, oh, yeah, I think I remember that. Is there anything else you want to talk about that? And so just to engage them in questions and use their names, I find, really helps. I, I know when I'm in school, if somebody asked us a, a question, um, the whole class would kind of uh, not make eye contact because that was always the kiss of death and the instructor would ask you. So what I want to do is make sure even the students from the back of the classroom to the front of the classroom are uh, being asked questions so that they're on their toes and they can uh, know that it's a safe place to ask questions and to get understanding. Um, I'll also walk around the classroom. So the classroom, the photo of the classroom we saw there is a, basically a big square with rows and I'll walk up and down the rows and ask questions and sometimes I'll, I'll lecture from the back of the classroom um, just to change the, the placement of where I am so it's not always stuck to just the computer and I'm going to be right there so the students um, know that they're being listened to and, um, and that I can connect with them. Uh, have a sense of humor. Oh, absolutely. You really have to have a sense of humor. I'm not sure how you survive in education without a sense of humor. You definitely have to deal with people. Um, I think a key thing is laughing at yourself as well. I know uh, when I make mistakes in class, and students will point it out, um, if you've ever had to code in class um, or do things in class and things don't work, there's always a panic that gets set in. And uh, I want to make sure. There you go make sure that I have a good sense of humor about what I'm doing as well. Again, if they know the direction, they know where you're going, if you've built up that trust, then it's a really uh, effective uh, tool of communication, I think. Uh, safe learning environment, yeah. So again, the whole thing, I'm, I'm building up a really safe learning environment for the students to be in. I know that they've uh, always said they really appreciate that they can ask me any question and uh, I'll be able to um, respond to them and I think one of the things I've learned is if I don't have an answer that I can say I don't have an answer but that's a really great question um, please email me about that and I'll be happy to look that up for you so I think in that terms when they don't have answers for things or when they think that they should know everything if they find that their instructor doesn't know it either that doesn't know everything that, um, that they have that freedom to ask and uh, know that I'll get back to them and give them resources that they can follow up with and I want, know that they want to be successful. So the feeling that there's a trust that I want them to be successful is a great way of communicating with the students. Okay. Cool, thank you, Lavinia. Uh, web design tutorial. Oh, you want to do a web design tutorial if you'd like now? Um, Emily, is there anything else you'd like me to talk about? Or I'm just flipping through my slides. No, that was really interesting. I think this is a good time to transition to the, the tutorial. Okay. Well, before I go to the tutorial, should I ask uh, the audience and say, you know, what what um, tips or techniques have you guys had? I'm just one instructor. Um, what are things you found that have worked really well in your classroom? I'll tell you one more thing that's worked well in my classroom. Um, when I teach interactive media one to my uh, graphic design students, again, they, when they, they hear the word code, it's like, ah, just like a lot of us, when we hear the word math, uh, creatives and math don't always go together. And uh, what I've got them to do for the first round of interactive courses is at the end of each class, take the last five minutes and email me a sentence. The sentence, I don't care about spelling and I don't care about grammar. It's just tell me what you learned in class today. And through that learning environment, through that, that sentence, I can get what they have learned in the class. Um, it helps them remember what they've learned in class. And then at the end of the semester, their final assignment is to write me an essay based on the sentences that they've sent me so they can copy and paste all the sentences into a word document and formulate that into a, a reflective essay i think too many times creatives um, don't take the time to celebrate what we do i think we do amazing work out there and um, often the, the response of creating an amazing creative piece is next as opposed to thinking 
what have I learned? What have I done? This is amazing stuff. I want them to feel confident and encouraged and that they can actually create. All right, I've got no response in the chat room to anything of what you guys are doing creatively, so I'm going to move on then. Yeah. Sound yeah. great, Emily? That sounds great. And if you if thoughts do occur to you, please feel free to continue to add in the chat room. We're keeping our eyes on that box as well as the questions. So uh, whenever you're inspired. Yeah, I keep thinking again, we're a community just because we're online here. It's, it's great that we can talk with people all around the world. I'm, I'm really impressed. Thank you, guys. Um, web design. So tutorial quick going through web design. When I'm talking about web design for me, here's the workflow that I will encourage all the students to go through. So I throw up this image about chess because it's about strategy. I want the students to think really strategically. Why are they doing anything? Or why are they doing something versus nothing? Um, when you get to the web, there's a lot of websites out there that um, that are kind of meaningless. They they basically you can rip out the name that's put on the the website and put any other company name in there, and that slogan will work with almost any company. So we really want to try and get at the heart of of strategy of why we're doing things. And I think if you can get the client to explain what's valuable to them, then I think that encourages what we do as creatives to have value for them. Oh, cool. How's got a thing? I use a dry erase board on the side of my classroom for students to write up questions that they have. Wonderful. Forcing me to see, yeah, in a safe place. Great. Yeah, I've heard of parking lots, um, what they called it before here where it's a parking lot where students can go and write questions there. Do you allow them to come up during the classroom and at any point in time, or are there specific times when you say, okay, if you have questions? Right. Oh, college is fun, right? Anytime. Oh, interesting. Very cool. Tyler, what grade uh, are you teaching? Are you teaching at the college level? Or are you teaching uh, K to 12? Oh, very cool. 11 to 12. Great. You'll get some good questions then. Thank you. After doing a strategy, then my recommendation, my favorite web design tool of all is a pen, paper and pencil or a pen and just to sketch down the ideas. So definitely working with wireframes and, um, and hopefully I'll show you some more about wireframes as we go forward, just getting the ideas down. So my whole challenge here is what should be included on the page? Let's sketch it out quickly because you can sketch things out really quick. You can erase things really quickly. And um, it's a very tactile thing that I think the clients actually work with and students resonate with as well as they understand the purpose of. Oh, Harold Laswell. When I was doing my master's in communication, I was introduced to Harold Laswell. Um, and he actually was one of the communication um, experts that they brought in to review um, Hitler's propaganda movies and to pick those apart and see what the communication was through there. Harold Laswell, my focus for him was to actually pick on his model of communication, which I call the strategy. And it's really simple. It just says who says what to whom in which channel with what effect. So who says what in which or which channel to whom with what effect, Harold Laswell. And if I break that down a little bit more, um, the who is always the client it says what says what is your content analysis, in which channel is your media analysis, to whom is your audience analysis, and with what effect your effect analysis. So who is the client? Says what? What is their key message? In which me channel? What media are they doing? Are they doing it in a website? Are they doing it in print media? Are they doing it in a sculpture? Whatever the, the choice is. And who's the audience? So we can connect with them. And uh, with what effect? What are the goals that you want? And I think those are always key to challenge um, students to think through things. Uh, the very first website I created for a client um, the reason that I created it was because his clients told him he should have a website. It was not a really good way to start. I didn't know at that point in time. And uh, after the year of having that website, he canceled his website and uh, never had a website again, as far as I understand. When I challenged him on it and said, well, how was your communication? How did you communicate that you had a website to your clients? And he said, oh, well, I just thought back in the day, Yahoo, as opposed to Google, that Yahoo, people just search online and they just find me and they buy my stuff. And I asked him, well, how did you tell people about your website? He said, oh, well, if, if I put it on any of my printed materials, I'd have to have my business cards reprinted and the fax reprinted. So I didn't do any of that. So it's really good to challenge students to think through what the goals are and who the audience is, what the media is, what the key message is, and communicate with the client. 
often one of the things I challenge my students is you're not creating a communication piece for that client, but for their client. So for the client's client, I need to hear that. Um, Photoshop. Photoshop is an amazing tool. I love it. They've added so much usability for web. Um, and I, I get to show the students all kinds of really great tools that Photoshop has in there. Um, my challenge is for them to see Photoshop layout as an HTML layout, connect to the wireframe Photoshop. So this is one presentation I actually created this year um, to try and encourage the students to see a workflow all the way through from their wireframes to Photoshop. So here's a, a sample of a wireframe that we created. Their logos at the top, navigation. We're going to have a hero image. We got tour packages. So this was for a website I made up called Ozeo Tours. Um, there's a photo gallery in here. There's a service section down there, packages, deals, tours, community, and the footer at the bottom with your uh, logo and copyright links, secondary links, and sign up for our email. So with the understanding of the placement and the size of the boxes, the logo's at the top, and it's actually kind of rather small. I'm not sure if any of you have seen uh, archive.org. Archive.org is a website that actually houses a lot of websites and show a lot of old websites. Um, one of the things I love to do is take students back to see Apple back in the day. And Apple, in I think it was even the early 90s, their logo on their web page was huge, just gargantuan. When you go do it today, it's up in the top corner, and it's great to ask them the questions, why do you think that is? Help them to think through things. So here's a bunch of boxes that they have on the page. Is all the content there that needs to be there? Is it in the right place? Is it the right size? And once a wireframe for a website has been created, then we can say, great, let's convert that over to a Photoshop design. The Photoshop at the top is actually a really fun photo that Dan Armstrong and I took at the last Adobe Education Leaders Summit. We waited for the sun to go down over the, uh, the ocean, and that got some great photos. So we took that photo, Dan lent me this, and uh, I was able to put the whole page together. So from the wireframe to the Photoshop, the actual design, and choosing the typefaces and choosing all the colors, and then saying, great, you've got the design. Now we need to start going into code. And this is where we take a look at code and start saying, okay, in web, we need to have a wrapper, a box that surrounds the entire website. And we need to have a header area that the logo and navigation can go into. And as the students started to walk down through this exercise, they went, oh, wait a minute. If I take a look at this um, design here, it actually looks a lot like my wireframe that I created. And so with that connection, the students all automatically found um, a value in doing the pencil sketches and doing the wireframes as they can see through all the way from the wireframes to Photoshop to actually creating um, the div boxes and layout in web. Ah, success. I'm working with brackets and with code. Okay, so graphic designers and coding, like I said before, is really not a great match. Um, I often equate it to kids and broccoli. Not sure if your kids like to eat broccoli, but I know my kids, um, they tend to eat the very tops of broccoli, and vegetables are really a foreign thing that gets pushed to the side of their plate. But apparently it's supposed to be good for them. But as I started teaching the students, I normally would go into Dreamweaver and show them the uh, graphic user interface, the design view, and uh, try and approach it that way. But when I was, again, at, the, um, at Adobe Max a few years back, I was challenged by one of the... Um, other educators that I was with to say, no, no, if you switch from Dreamweaver, which shows the students GUI, to go into brackets where it's just code, watch the difference. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try that and see what happens. If everything fails, I've still got Dreamweaver and I can go back. So I downloaded this app called Brackets, and it's available for app from Apple for Windows, for Linux. Um, it's open source. It's got the backing of Adobe. Um, and so I thought, this is a good risk. So as I talked with the students and started to show them brackets, um, here are five reasons that I thought um, brackets actually really worked in our program. Uh, number one, you get a live preview. So as you're creating an HTML document, you can actually click on a lightning bolt, and I'll show you uh, a page with that icon on it, and immediately launches Chrome, and any changes that I make inside HTML gets uh, displayed right in Chrome. For the students, that's just such a total win for them. Uh, one of the students said, this is instant gratification. I can do something and automatically it changes. So once they started to catch on to that idea, I thought, okay, I've got something here. I can now inspire them to keep going. 
uh, HTML and CSS code hinting. So as they start to type in the HTML code, Brackets is right there trying to figure out what they're coding and help them um, enter in the code that they want, as well as closing tags. So if you've done any HTML coding, um, if you have to close tags, it can be arduous, and that brackets just really helps with that. So again, the students um, take that as a win because the, the tags automatically close for them, so they don't have to remember to do that. Um, quick docs. Oh, amazing. When I'm inside um, brackets and I'm coding inside CSS and I forget something, I can actually type in the code for, say, color. And when I have a quick give command K, um, which is knowledge, it'll actually show me um, a little description of what I'm coding. And if I don't understand that, it takes me to a website for the students. I'm not sure if your students are all buying textbooks. Um, my students aren't buying as many textbooks. So this is a great online resource for them. Uh, number four, Adobe has extensions for brackets. And there, is, there are so many extensions that are out there. And I'll show you a few of those as well, talk about those too. Um, the extensions are free, so we can install it. And the students um, really enjoy the, the extensions once they've gone through the long way of coding to know that, oh, there's a, an extension that I can install for free that actually just puts in the basic HTML code. Oh, did I mention brackets is free? So the students love that fact. Um, Students last semester, uh, partway through, were realizing finally that Brackets is free and they can download it, even though I told them that. But once they were able to download it, all of a sudden, uh, it really connected with them. Oh, I can do this at home. Oh, this is really cool. So I love getting that response from them. Inside Brackets, again, here we are. Um, if I have a, a page open inside Brackets, I can click on the lightning bolt on the side, and that's what launches Chrome. And again, that's just such a cool way to see it live code what I'm doing in the HTML actually display in a web browser. How cool is that? And this is what a page would look like inside your Chrome web browser. This is your default bracket. So when you download brackets as well, brackets actually gives you an HTML page that says getting started with brackets. It also gives you CSS files so you have something to play with immediately. Um, and talk about closing tags. So this is your heading three and inside the heading three tag um, Second, I start the open angle bracket, H3, close the angle bracket. It immediately adds the closing tag here. If I'm starting to type any variables um, up in meta, name equals, it will ask me, what do I want? And so again, it really helps me in uh, remembering what should be there and give me the proper options. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have issues with spelling, but sometimes creatives do, and it drops in the spelling for them as well. So again, this makes it really easy for the students to start to get into the code and not make it as arduous as uh, the word code can sound, because code is a four letter word. When I talked about knowledge, so here I am inside a CSS file, and font-family is one of those uh, properties that I can click inside of. When I use the quick key command K, all of a sudden it brings up the information about what a font family is, and it gives me some of the variables for font family, and then the option to read more. So I can actually go in, uh, read even more about that online. There you go. And this is the website it brings you to. So web platform docs tells you about font family and gives you a whole lot more information to give you a deeper understanding of what the code actually means. And here's your extensions. So the little logo brick icon on the side is what you click to actually be able to see any extensions. and. Um, when you click on that, you, there's so many that you can view through and just do a quick search on. So I can do a search for HTML templates is one of the ones I highly recommend. So here's HTML templates by Travis Alman, and I can go and click the install button over here. It's grayed out because I already had it installed. And this is what allows the students to get an HTML template propped into an, any blank new page that they create within seconds. Oh, amazing. Uh, here's the extension. If you have Creative Cloud, this just blew my mind. There's a really cool extension called Extract. And I can upload anything I'd like to the Creative Cloud, a layered PSD file. And if I do a layered PSD file, then I can actually show my layered PSD file inside my HTML coding application. I can go down and I can turn on the layers that I've got here and scroll through all the layers from Photoshop and it's live, and I can actually copy the text that's here and paste it right into my HTML. If I was in CSS, it would actually allow me to code in font-family, and it'll pull 
the font that I've used from Photoshop, the color that I've used, the size of the font, whether it's italic or not. So it really helps repurpose my Photoshop designs for web and use them in code. But wait, there's more and there's so many more things. Um, so I added number four again, uh, display the website folder structure. So that should be number five. The website folder structure up here is along the sidebar so the students can actually see what they're doing. So I get them to create a folder for their HTML file, drag it up inside here, and they can see everything inside here, whether it's CSS, images, HTML files, anything inside that website, and they have access to it. Uh, the image hover tag, if they're typing in an IMG, if they're linking coding uh, an image tag so they can link to an outside image, if they've done it correctly and they hover over the image name, then up pops a small thumbnail image to tell them they've got it connected to the right image. It also then displays the width and the height of that image as well, so they can interact. Um, you can add a CSS rule within an HTML file. So what's great is I'm working inside the HTML file, and there's a, another quickie, so Command K for knowledge and Command E for edit. And you can go and add a CSS rule into the CSS file, even though you're in the HTML file. So I think that's just a really cool option as well. Um, and here's some quick student responses. The icing on the cake, as it were. Uh, Shelby said, I've never felt so accomplished in my life. And yes, those are her exclamation marks. Kaylee says, I'm starting to find coding really interesting. Great. Coding does not seem as hard as I thought it was. Thank you, Gianluca. I actually survived the class without needing a lot of help. And that was super exciting. Again, another successful student, Dana. And this is uh, this week in class, I think this HTML and CSS stuff, CSS stuff finally clicked in my head making much more sense to me and I cannot wait to try building my own site. So I think those are amazing responses to graphic designers who were introduced to coding. I think I'm running out of time. How am I doing, Emily? You are doing great, Kevin. In fact, uh, as you're, you continued with your presentation, Remy and I just kept getting closer and closer to our monitors and Remy finally said, I really want to go back to school all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for these comments. Um, if you have any Anything else you want to add? If not, we can switch and just open it up in our last few minutes in case anyone has any questions. Um, we're, we, please go ahead and post them in the questions for Kevin box and, and Kevin will address them. Anybody have any? Uh, Barbara has one there. Great. Um, did, any, uh, did your students have any other exposure to HTML and CSS before they started with brackets? The majority of them know. I keep getting surprised at that. I keep waiting for the students to all come into the class going, we know all of this stuff, but they haven't yet. Um, maybe out of the 70 students that I teach from scratch HTML, uh, there's maybe four that have had experience with it. So for me, I get thrilled again when you're teaching students something new and they're actually getting it. You know, Shelby, who is like just struggling, and then all of a sudden it clicked and she's like, I can't believe it. This is amazing. Yeah, I see another question coming up. Is it okay if I respond with the mic as opposed to typing things out? Oh, yes, please do. Okay. All right. Here's a great question. Um, from Maria. Is it better to learn HTML first or simultaneously with CSS? Great question. I um, actually get them to go to HTML first. I get them to type out things on the page so everything is in Times New Roman and they can see how things look. Uh, I love seeing the amazement when they create a first HTML page and then they view it in the, their own web browser and then they change things and they can see things happening right away. Uh, I love it when they experiment because we're dealing with creatives. Uh, I remember last year, two years ago, there was as we started to get into type, and then we showed them CSS, so they understood the content versus the design portion of it. It was just um, hilarious because one of the students, um, her model was facing me, and she went on her own and decided, "I'm going to make this like 300 pixel Comic Sans pink bold italic." Um, I think they missed the underline there just to make it complete. But they were playing with it. another student side instead of Comic Sans. They were going to use Zap Dingbats as the font for their website. So they're just they're just enjoying it. So yeah, I do HTML first and then CSS. Uh, Michael, yes, I believe uh, Emily, we're recording the session. Yes, we are. 
we'll post that recording and so you can take advantage of it later. Thanks, Michael. Oh, Tom, Tom noted that if he teaches, uh, he's teaching the web development, very cool. Uh, I'd love to learn stuff from you. If I teach coding first, the students are not happy working in Dreamweaver later. I agree. In fact, when I used to teach Dreamweaver, I would teach the design portion of it first to my students, and then I would go and teach the coding portion of it as we went along, because I wanted to get them more comfortable with things. And then what I found is when we switched over from interactive uh, media design one to two, I had about half of the students that were like, please don't show us the Dreamweaver design view, only show us code, and the other half saying, please show us the design view. And that actually made uh, teaching harder for me. So by introducing the code straight away, it actually uh, put everybody at the same playing field. Yeah, Tom, you're a huge fan. When did you start using brackets? Oh, very cool. Uh, about uh, two years ago, I'm, I've been using brackets for probably, I think, three years now, three and a half years. Um, I know I was following them on Twitter, and it was really hilarious because they asked if anybody wanted to uh, test out this new beta, and the beta was actually working with the um, extract extension. And uh, so I immediately tweeted back, say, I'd love to be a part of that. So they said, okay, great. Uh, we're in San Francisco. And I said, oh, I'm in Toronto. And they said, great, we'll be in Toronto in a month. Can we talk with you? So it was really great to see the product managers had a great um, interest in hearing what educators were saying too. Great. Uh, folks, I'm just oh. going to transition to our closing screen in case people have to sign off soon. Uh, but we're going to continue with the question and answer from Kevin as we do this. Uh, before we do, I just want to draw your attention to some of our up-and-coming uh, professional development sessions in the top box. Uh, continue firing off your questions for Kevin, and if you can, before you leave, please give us some feedback in the, in the boxes at the bottom of the page. So, let's see. I think you had another question from Barbara. I did. Oh, just so you know, I, I was not the one who clicked on strongly agree, so it's not me voting for myself, but thank you. That's amazing. Thank you for the feedback, guys. Um, Barbara, do you do a Photoshop design and then convert it into brackets? And how do you integrate your design with the brackets interface? So the students right now, I, I definitely get them to work through the wireframe, then a Photoshop design, and then we show them how to export the assets out of Photoshop and then import them into brackets. Um, I would love to show them all how to do um, the brackets extract straight from, um, straight from Photoshop itself inside brackets, but not all of them have the Creative Cloud account at this point in time. Uh, how do you integrate your design with the brackets interface? So basically, it's showing the students how to do floats and clears and defining things ahead of time, which again, once they get the feel of how to create a layout using HTML and CSS, um, what I love this year is that really they went back and said, ah, so the wireframes make a lot more sense. I really need to be making sure that my wireframes are, uh, are on par. Um, Claudia says it feels overrun the speed at at what the program is challenged and developed. Ah, uh, yes, what's a good way to keep up to date? Well, thankfully, at least in the realm of HTML, um, HTML5 has been pretty much standard for the past few years. There's a really good book out there called the HTML and CSS book, and um, it's written by John Duckett, and that was it's a few years old, but the content in it is still relevant. Um, with the different programming languages changed and developed, I think for it, it's what you see as well. I keep looking on out at different websites, and as I use websites where I notice things that all of a sudden have changed, uh, I think in the past year and a half, I've noticed these push menus are starting to become really popular, um, where you click on and a, a navigation flies in from the side. Um, the, that's one of the ways I think just in using the technology that we're all using that we can actually um, connect that way. And that's one of the ways I stay up to date. The other way is, uh, like as Emily was talking, as Remy was talking before, we, I'm in a large college and I take time out of my uh, schedule to go up to the North Head and North Campus where a lot of the uh, propeller heads are and I talk with those guys and I challenge them. Um, I have a great resource, Tom Green, who is in the, the education leader and he's on lynda.com and he's on about.com. He's uh, one of my friends at the North where I, I can get a chance to talk with him. And then we just challenge each other. What are you doing here? And then I share content. There's always seems to be this group where you keep content to yourself or share content. I don't want to give away my content because other people will take that. And I've always been in the uh, side of uh, sharing content. And I find that as I share content that uh, people will challenge me as well. 
Well, thank you so much, Kevin. I realize we've reached the end of the hour. I feel like this conversation could continue for quite a while. Um, I, I really appreciate the time that you took to prepare, and this was just such an informative presentation and so interesting. Um, thank you. Uh, do you have any closing comments before we wrap things up? Um, I think the closing comments is if we're all in this creative field, talk with each other. Um, be excited about it. And I want to just uh, thank all the educators that are out there because you are making a difference. Be engaged in students' um, education. Encourage them when they're doing well and challenge them when they're doing, um, when they can do better. I think they appreciate both sides of it. I think if everybody just says, you're doing amazing at everything, if everything, I always remember the Incredibles, when everybody has superpowers, nobody will be super. So encourage them when they're doing well and, and challenge them on where is that they can do better. And for you as well, and for me too. Great, thank you. And I know Kevin put up his contact information at the beginning of his presentation. You can also uh, follow him on the Adobe Education Exchange. Um, and if you haven't visited the exchange yet, please do. Uh, it's a great way to connect with educators like Kevin throughout the world and to share what you're doing in the classroom as well. And we'd love to hear from you. So I'm going to go ahead, go ahead and leave the room open for a little bit in case you have any other comments. Um, you can continue to share those in the, in the chat pod. Great. Thank you, Emily. Thank you.